Empress Theodora cut an impressive figure in history. She pulled herself up from the bottom of society to become one of the most powerful people in the world, the Empress of the Byzantine Empire. But before we get into her rise to Empress, let's look at what led up to her ascent to power. When Emperor Anastasius died in 518, he left no heirs or empress to succeed him. Thus, the decision fell to the Senate. They elected Justin, the Count of Exubiters, a man who was originally a peasant from the Balkans, but who worked his way up through the military until he became emperor. Justin brought with him his adopted nephew, Justinian, who became his second-in-command. Justin was a devout Chalcedonian Christian. Chalcedonians believed in the duality of Christ, that he was both man and divine simultaneously. Justin heavily persecuted the Monophysites, those who believed that Christ was divine and only appeared as a human while on earth. Both considered the other to be heresy, even though the Pope and the Church in Rome were Chalcedonian. Many Monophysites fled the persecution, taking refuge in the city of Alexandria in Egypt, who already had a large population of Monophysites. Justin was reluctant to continue his persecution in Alexandria due to its long history of turbulence, as well as Constantinople's reliance on its grain production. Therefore, the population of Monophysites in Alexandria flourished. Back in Constantinople, Justinian was making a name for himself as a patron of the Blue Faction, one of the four chariot teams that raised in the Hippodrome. The other teams were the Greens, Reds, and Whites, though the main two were the Blues and Greens. The factions were also in charge of the theatrical productions and the Hippodrome, which included comedic mimes, dancing, as well as animal taming. The Greens and the Blues had an immense rivalry with one another, and the rivalry only heightened under Justinian's patronage. While the Blues were protected, the Greens were repressed, which led to much violence between the two. One such instance of violence happened in 523, when a riot broke out that killed a citizen. Because Justinian was deathly ill at the time, he was unable to do anything. An urban prefect named Theodore Colosynthius was sent in to restore order. He was ruthless and ended up either hanging or burning blues alive as punishment. When Justinian recovered, he was furious. He exiled Theodore, who was forced to join a monastery in order to escape assassination. The reason for Justinian's patronage was most likely political. He wanted a group of those he could rely on for his future political endeavors. It was through this that he met his future wife, Theodora. Theodora was born around the year 495 in Constantinople. She had two other sisters, her older sister Komito and her younger sister Anastasia, who unfortunately passed away while she was still young. Theodora's father was a bear keeper for the Green Faction, while their mother was a former actress. When she was around the age of five, Theodora's father passed away. Because Theodora's mother was most likely retired when Komito was born, the family had no source of income. She quickly remarried in hopes that her husband could become the next bear keeper of the Greens. Unfortunately, another candidate was chosen, and Theodora's mother became desperate. She presented her three daughters in front of the crowds at the Hippodrome, begging for compassion from the Greens. Although they showed no interest, the Blues took pity on the family and offered Theodora's stepfather the position of bear keeper for their faction, as their own had recently passed. From then on, Theodora would become a staunch supporter of the Blues who showed her family kindness. Because Theodora's mother was a former actress, both Theodora and her sister Komito were required by law to also become actresses. Actresses were at the very bottom of society, 
seen as no better than prostitutes, and many of them were. Actresses were denied many of the rights that those of higher standings were given, including the right to marry high-ranking officials, as well as the sacraments. Actresses could only be given the sacraments on their deathbeds, and if they made a recovery, they were forbidden from returning to the stage. An actress could leave the stage by repenting and joining a convent, but if she was seen being indecent, she would be forced back into becoming an actress for the rest of her life. There were two types of actresses that performed in the Hippodrome, dancers and mimes. Dancers were lower in social standing and were often prostitutes as well. Mimes, who performed in comedies, were often courtesans, selling sexual favors to those in higher-ranking positions. Theodora was the latter. Sometime in her early 20s, Theodora left the, the stage potentially due to the birth of her only child, a daughter whose name is unknown. She became the concubine of Hesebalus, who would be assigned as the governor of Contempolis in Africa. Theodora went with him. Although she couldn't legally marry Hesebalus, becoming his concubine allowed her to leave the stage as well as give her financial stability. Unfortunately, the relationship ended badly and she was forced to leave. Her and her young daughter traveled to the city of Alexandria. It's here that she most likely came into contact with Monophysites, who would go on to greatly influence her religion. She would later go on to become a Monophysite and protector of Monophysite refugees. Theodora didn't stay in Alexandria long and quickly moved on to the city of Antioch. Here, she met a woman named Macedonia, a dancing girl who was also employed as a spy for the Blue Faction. Her job was to report to Justinian the goings-on of the faction and what other people in charge didn't want him to know. Macedonia got Theodora a job as a spy, and that is most likely how Justinian and Theodora came to meet. They quickly fell in love, and Theodora became Justinian's concubine. By the year 523, Justinian had moved Theodora up to the rank of patrician. In 524, Justinian convinced his uncle, Justin, to change the laws that forbade him from marrying a former actress, and Theodora and Justinian were married by 525. From then on, the law stated that an actress who abandoned her work and repented was able to marry above their class. Children of actresses were also given more rights. Those who were born after their mother repented could marry freely and those born before their mother repented could petition the emperor for the right to marry, as could those whose mothers died while still working as an actress. It's unknown how many actresses actually benefited from this new law, likely not many because of the specific circumstances that they had to meet. But Comito, Theodora's older sister, married the officer Cetus. Theodora's friend Antonina, also a former actress, married Belisarius, who would go on to become a powerful military leader, and Theodora's own daughter married a descendant of the former emperor, Anastasius. On April 1st, 527, Justin crowned Justinian co-emperor. He would die four months later, thus making Justinian and Theodora the new emperor and empress of the Byzantine Empire. Although there have been powerful empresses alongside a weak emperor, Theodora is unique in that she was a powerful figure alongside her husband. In order to showcase her power, she required that officials prostrate themselves in front of them when they wanted to meet. Theodora and Justinian were equals, and her husband sought her counsel on almost everything. She would accompany him to meetings where they would argue different viewpoints in front of everyone. It was likely that they had already discussed beforehand who would win the debate. It was well known that Justinian consulted her on all laws put into place, and her name appears in many of them. One of Theodora's reputations of empress was that of a protector. She wanted to protect prostitutes in Constantinople, specifically child prostitutes. She rounded up all of the prostitutes in the city and had them sent to a refuge that her and Justinian had built to house them. There, they were able to live a peaceful life. When prostitution eventually returned to the streets, her and Justinian had it banned altogether. 
Although her campaign didn't work long term, the fact that she saw the prostitutes as victims instead of criminals was different from the status quo and was likely influenced from her time as an actress. She saw how prostitutes lived on the brink of death and often only turned to that work out of desperation. She did her best to help them, and although the prostitution remained in Constantinople, she helped many prostitutes in her refuge. Theodora had several hospices built around Constantinople in order to house the sick and dying. She was also known to be especially generous with her donations, as seen by her donation of a church to protect people after a devastating earthquake in Antioch. Theodora also established herself as a protector of Monophysites. Although Justinian had stopped the persecution, they still faced much oppression. Theodora's role as their protector wasn't just done out of goodwill. As long as there was a Monophysite in the palace, the Monophysite population would remain loyal to it. Justinian's role as a Chalcedonian and Theodora's role as a Monophysite kept the loyalty of both. Theodora housed many Monophysite refugees in the palace. She was known to visit them regularly in order to receive their blessings, and Justinian would sometimes go along. Even after her death, Justinian continued to offer them protection. One such person who was under her protection was Anthemus, who she helped get elected as a patriarch of Constantinople. After he was excommunicated by the Pope, he disappeared despite summons. After Theodora's death, it was found that he had been living under her protection in the women's quarters of the palace for 12 years. Not even Justinian knew he was there. Despite her reputation for kindness, Theodora could be ruthless to those she saw as a threat to her power. Germanus was Justinian's cousin and an extremely talented field commander. Yet despite his talent, his career stalled while Justinian's moved forward. Theodora made sure to block any sort of advancement for Germanus, for if Justinian died, he would be next in line. In 536, Justinian placed Germanus in charge of suppressing a revolt in Africa. He was victorious, yet he was removed from power three years later. Germanus was placed in charge of a losing battle in 540 when the Shah of Persia invaded the eastern provinces. Germanus was sent to war with only 300 troops to defend Antioch. It ended in failure and Antioch fell. Theodora's open hostility towards Germanus not only affected him but his children as well. No one wanted to marry them. When John, an officer in the Gothic War, Germanus was placed in charge of a losing battle in 540 when the Shah of Persia invaded the eastern provinces. Germanus was sent to war with only 300 troops to defend Antioch. It ended in failure and Antioch fell. Theodora's open hostility towards Germanus not only affected him but his children as well. No one wanted to marry them for fear of getting on the bad side of the empress. When John, an officer in the Gothic War returning from Italy, attempted to marry Germanus' daughter, Justina, Theodora did all she could to get them to break the engagement. When he refused, Theodora threatened to ruin him. When he returned to Italy, John was under the command of Belisarius, Antonina's husband. Antonina was a close friend of Theodora, and she had accompanied her husband to the battlefront. John was suspicious that Antonina had come along in order to dispose of him under Theodora's orders, and this distrust read to Belisarius. The atmosphere of the army was already tense, and the further distrust led to its failure in Italy. Even Antonina herself couldn't escape her friend's ruthlessness. Theodora wanted her grandson, Anastasius, to marry Belisarius' only child, Joannina, who is set to inherit his massive fortunes. Antonina and Belisarius were not in a position to refuse due to Belisarius' own falling out with Justinian. When Justinian was deathly ill with the plague in 542, Belisarius and another man were overheard speaking of his succession. 
saying that they would never follow another emperor like Justinian. Theodora was outraged and reported it to Justinian when he recovered. Belisarius was stripped of his position and lived in fear until he was placed in charge of the war against the Ostrogoths in 544. The man who he had been speaking with, Bozus, was placed in solitary confinement underground for two years and four months before he was given his position back, though his eyesight never recovered from his time in the darkness. So Antonina and Belisarius were not able to refuse the proposal. But even though she was agreed, she agreed to the wedding, Antonina continued to push it off until Theodora became suspicious. In order to make sure the marriage happened, Theodora had Joannina and Anastasia slipped together in order to ruin the girl's reputation and prospects of another marriage. But Theodora died eight months later, and Antonina called the wedding off. Theodora's most hated opponent was John the Cappadocian, the Praetorian Prefect of Constantinople. John was corrupt and hated by nearly everyone, but he was a talented tax collector and made himself necessary to Justinian. Theodora made her hatred well known to, to her husband, but Justinian did nothing. Theodora felt threatened by the power John the Cappadocian had over her husband and plotted his downfall. She had Antonina trick John's only child, his daughter Euphemia, into believing that her and Belisarius hated Theodora and Justinian, and that they believed that with her father's help, they could overthrow them. Euphemia relayed the information to her father. John fell for the trick. He agreed to meet with Antonina at one of Belisarius's villas in the city. Theodora made sure to have two officials concealed nearby. When John and Antonina began talking, the officials rushed out to arrest him. John's guard stopped them, and he fled. Justinian had John banished to Sisychus in 541 and made a deacon, but he refused to perform his duties. When the bishop of Sisychus was killed, John was suspected, and he was punished and banished to Egypt. Theodora never stopped pursuing him, and it wasn't until after her death that he was allowed to return to Constantinople but he was never able to return to his previous position. Theodora's reputation for ruthlessness also covered acts of violence she had no hand in. She's been accused of orchestrating the murder of Amala Suintha, the daughter of the previous king of the Ostrogoths. Theodora felt threatened by Amala Suintha, she was a powerful, noble-born woman, and Theodora feared that if her and Justinian met, he would seek Amala Suintha's counsel over her own. The rumor goes that in order to remove Amala Suintha, Theodora had Justinian send out her protege, Peter the Patrician, under the guise of negotiation with Italy. When Peter reached Amala Suintha, he killed her, thus removing the threat Theodora felt. This story has been proven to be false, but many people at the time believed it impossible because it fit with Theodora's image of ruthlessness. What most likely happened was this. Peter the Patrician was sent out to negotiate with the king of the Ostrogoths in Italy over the city of Lilibaeum in Sicily. On the way, the envoy was met by ambassadors who had been sent by Amala Suintha, who said that there was a new king on the throne, Theodahad. Amala Suintha had placed her cousin Theodahad on the throne after the death of her son in hopes that she could control him. This backfired, for when Justinian's envoy reached the Ionian Sea, ambassadors from Theodahad came to tell them that Amala Suintha had been imprisoned. Justinian quickly drafted up a letter of support of Amala Suintha to send along with Peter, but by the time he reached the city, Amala Suintha was dead. This gave Justinian the reason he needed to invade Italy. So although there's no proof that Theodora was the one to have Amala Suintha killed, people believed her to be ruthless enough to do it. Theodora's reputation for ruthlessness was so feared that people would rather follow her than Justinian in some cases. Around 540, Theodore requested that Justinian let her send missionaries to the Nobidae and Nubia 
in order to convert them. He refused on the grounds that he didn't want to modify the population in the area and arranged to have his own missionary sent. Justinian sent word to the Duke of Thebaid that he would be sending a group of missionaries and that the Duke was to help them along the way. Theodora sent her own letter to the Duke, saying, Be warned that if you permit this, his ambassador to arrive there before mine, and do not hinder him by various pretexts until mine shall have reached you, and pass through your province and arrive at his destination, your life shall answer for it, for I will immediately send and take off your head. The Duke feared Theodora more than Justinian, and when Justinian's missionaries arrived, he delayed them by saying that the pack animals weren't ready yet. When Theodora's missionaries arrived, he sent them on their way quickly. By the time Justinian's missionaries reached the Nobide, they had already been converted. Even though Theodora went behind his back, Justinian didn't do much in reaction. Politically speaking, as long as there was one group of Christians in the area, it didn't matter if they were Monophysite or Chalcedonian. Both would be loyal to the throne in the end. In early January of 532, violence broke out once again between the Blues and Greens. The man that was sent to deal with the violence treated the Greens as their scapegoats, and they upped the violence. When Justinian chose to deal with the factions equally, the Blues felt betrayed. Seven men from both factions were captured and sentenced to death, but the execution was botched. Two men, a blue and a green, survived and took refuge in a monastery. On Tuesday, January 13, at the Hippodrome, a few days after the execution attempt, the blues and greens demanded that Justinian pardon the men. He refused, and the factions united and set fire to the Praetorium. The violence spread, and the Hagia Sophia was also destroyed. In an effort to appease the crowds, Justinian attempted to resume the races the next day, but the rioters set fire to the Hippodrome. They demanded that Justinian replace three corrupt officials, and though Justinian complied, the riots continued. On January 15, the mob went to the palace of one of former Emperor Anastasius' nephews in order to make him the new emperor, but he had correctly chosen to be out of town. They burned down his palace and moved on. Troops from Thrace were brought in to take down the mob, but they were ineffective. On Sunday, Justinian went to the imperial box at what was left of the Hippodrome and offered to pardon the rioters but they continued and Justinian was forced to flee back to the palace. At the palace, Justinian ordered some of his senators to leave, including two more of Anastasius' nephews, Hypatius and Pompeius, despite their protests. Neither Hypatius or Pompeius had shown anything other than loyalty towards Justinian, but he was still fearful and sent them away. He didn't want those who he couldn't fully trust around, so he made them all leave. This would backfire. The mob declared Hypatius the new emperor, and the senators who were forced to leave switched to the side of the rioters. With every one of his plans having backfired, Justinian saw no other option other than to flee. But Theodora stepped in and was said to give a rousing speech. As for the belief that a woman ought not to show daring in the presence of men, or act boldly when men hesitate, in the present crisis, I think we have no time left to ask if we accept it or not. For when what we hold is in extreme peril, we are left with no other course of action except to make the best plan we can to deal with the plight we face. As for me, I believe that flight is not the, the correct course to take now, if ever, even if it serves to save our lives. For no person who has been born can escape death, but for a man who has once been emperor to become a runaway, that we cannot bear. I hope to never have the imperial purple stripped from me, nor to live to the day when the people I meet fail to address me as empress. So if what you want is to save yourself, O emperor, it's no problem. We have plenty of money. Over yonder is a sea, and here are the boats. Yet ask yourself, if the time will come, 
once you are safe, when you would gladly give up security for death. As for me, this is an ancient maxim I hold true, that kingship makes a good burial shroud. The speech worked, and more troops were sent in to deal with the riots. Belisarius, who had returned from his battle with Persia with his powerful veteran guard, and Mundo, a Gepid prince who was in charge of a unit of barbarian Herulians, attacked the mob at the Hippodrome. 35,000 people were killed, and Hypatius and Pompeius were seized. Hypatius tried to appease Justinian by saying he had brought the mob to the Hippodrome so they could be taken care of, but Justinian replied by asking him why he waited until the city was destroyed to do it. Both Hypatius and Pompeius were promptly executed, though they were pardoned posthumously, and their property was restored to their children. In 541, the same year she had disposed of John the Cappadocian, Theodore received a quest from the Gassinid Emer. The Emer wanted a monophysite bishop for his tribe, but there were none. This was not a small request, because if a monophysite bishop was consecrated, it would solidify the separation between the Chalcedonians and the Monophysites. They were still technically considered part of the same church, but if a bishop was ordained, more could be ordained and a patriarch could be chosen, which would create a completely separate hierarchy from the Orthodox one. But Theodora quickly complied, potentially because the Byzantine Empire needed the protection of the Gassanids and couldn't afford to lose them. Two men were ordained as bishops, Theodore in Bostra and Jacob bar Adai in Edessa, although neither lived in the cities themselves and instead kept nomadic lifestyles. Jacob bar Adai had originally come to Constantinople early on in Theodora's reign as empress in order to ask her for help in defending Monophysites, and he stayed in Constantinople for 15 years. Jacob was a master of his disguise as he moved from place to place, Baradai comes from the Syriac word for horse cloth, which is what he covered himself in. He posed as a beggar, seamlessly blending in wherever he went. During his travels, Jacob ordained thousands of priests and deacons and consecrated 30 bishops. He organized an Egyptian monophysite church, which will go on to be the Jacobite church. Theodora is given part of the credit of its founding for she was the one who originally allowed it to happen. She is also given credit for the permanent split between the Chalcedonians and Monophysites, despite her best intentions. Theodora passed away in 548, potentially from cancer, although the exact cause isn't known. Even after her death, Justinian would honor Theodora's wishes by continuing to offer protection to the Monophysite refugees that she sheltered. Justinia never remarried and passed away 17 years later. Theodora presents an interesting figure in history. She was born in a time when women held very little power and born into a profession where she held even less. She was able to claw her way up from the very bottom of society into the highest position one could attain. Powerful empresses were not new, but Theodora was unique. Empresses who were truly powerful held that power when their emperor was weak. Theodora was a powerful empress with an equally powerful husband, and she held that power because Justinian truly respected her. He would have had to. Theodora was an ex-actress-slash-courtesan and a monophysite to boot. Justinian viewed her as his equal, and she used that to her advantage as much as possible, although her insecurity and her power shone through at times, especially when it came to figures like Germanus and John the Cappadocian. Although she was heavily slandered by her enemies both during and after her reign, she was smart and resourceful, and they had to respect her wit. In conclusion, Theodora was a complex individual, both cunning and kind, ruthless and compassionate a truly powerful empress. 
Here is the Works Cited slide for the presentation on Empress Theodora, where you'll see the different sources that were used.